Okay. Good. So this is the, as you know, until two, until two years ago, we, this, we had the good, uh, the good habit to, to have during the solstices, the solstice of uh, winter and also the summer, to have some party, to have some, some, some time to, to share some food and some talk and, and, and to, share the, to share the time. But uh, since two years ago, this, this is becoming difficult, and this year is not an exception. So this uh, is not is not very convenient to have a, a, a strong social interaction. But at least it's good to have a, at least a, once a year is some um, some place, some some event in which we can uh, share with the others what what we have have been doing in, in science. So this is uh, this is the objective of this of this session today. So uh, several people, not all the institute, because we are too many, but part of the institute will will comment during five minutes uh, some specific work that uh, he or she has 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 done during during this year. And this way, we will have a, some idea of the type of work we are doing at at IFISC, uh, on the, the extension, the the diversity, and also the depth of the of the of the work that people is is doing here. Um, okay, so I uh, then I will I, I thank you all all of you all the people that will talk for 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 accepting the invitation and also to all of you that are attending and, and just to to say before starting also it's a, it's a nice. Um, it's uh, something that we used to do. It was a, a picture, a group picture that is useful to have in, 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 in reports and all that. Now the, the equivalent to a group picture is the group of the, of the, of the cameras in Zoom. So if you, uh, so it could be good that now everybody that has a camera uh, 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 puts, the camera, puts the camera on. And uh, then I will I will make some some uh, screen capture, of, and then uh, in this in this way we will have some some uh, some group picture even if it's uh, not not really uh, we are not really together but but we are in but but at least we will be together on the screen okay so I will do there are several screens so let's do. Uh, Let's see if I am able to do it. This is okay. I have done already one screen. Just a moment. Uh, okay. Very nice. Now the second screen. Let's see. And a third screen. And I think that this is all the screens we there are no more. Okay, there are three screens of people. We are seventy people, so we are a large number. And then let's before instead of talking more, let's let's tell the people talk about science. So the first the first uh, researcher that will share with us some work is Masi Zanin. So you, I think you should be able to to share your screen. I should, uh, and you should see now my screen and hear me hopefully. Yes. Here it is. Perfect. That's so great. Have, uh, remember, <laughs> the, the we, we will is not have questions. Problem. Yes, five minutes. And I, of course, I will stop you if you, you, you are above this, this time. But uh, OK, go ahead. You have five minutes for that. <laughs> Okay, okay, perfect, thank you. So I'm going to present to you a work that I've done in collaboration with a good friend of mine, David Papo, who is now working at the University of Ferrara in Italy. 
And that is about uh, the comparison and assessing of different uh, tests and algorithms to detect irreversibility in time series. So first of all, just a, a small, a short overview of what irreversibility is. Uh, if we have a system or let's say a time series, uh, we say that it is irreversible, irreversible if there is something that tells us what is the true uh, direction or of the arrow of time in this time series. That is, if there is something that tell us whether what we are seeing is the original time series or is the time reversed one. Because in the second case, there is something wrong about the system or about what we are seeing of the system. So this is the typical example. Let's imagine that I show you this uh, uh, set of this movie, let's say this set of pictures in which I start with a glass filled with water. And then suddenly this water like condensates in ice cubes. And at the end, I have just ice cubes and no water. And you will tell me there is something wrong here, clearly, because usually it's the opposite. That is, you start with ice cubes that melt down, and at the end, you have water. So this is an example of an irreversible system, because actually, we know that entropy can only be produced and not dissipated. And therefore, we have, let's say, a natural arrow of time. So why is this important? Well, first of all, from a theoretical point of view, there are a lot of works that explain uh, what uh, uh, irreversibility is, is a fundamental property of non-equilibrium systems, uh, stems from the presence of memory or nonlinear dynamics, and more generally represents the entropy production of these systems away from equilibrium. And it has found many applications in different fields from economics and finance to medicine. For instance, we have shown that there are differences in the way the brain dynamics dynamics uh, appears to us between control subject and patients suffering from different conditions like Parkinson's. So what is the problem about irreversibility? Well, the problem is that if we have a time series, there are several tests and algorithms that have been designed in the last 30 years, more or less, to detect this irreversibility. Here you have some of them. And the problem is that each one of these tests is based on different hypotheses on the data, detects different patterns in the data, there are different parameters that you have to tune or that you have to understand what they are doing. So our idea was, okay, let's take all these algorithms and let's try to benchmark them and understand if there is one of them that is better than the other. And of course the, the answer is quite complicated. And if we start by the simple analysis that we can make that in this case, we created a bunch of time series that are irreversible through, um, through a logistic map. And then we calculated the fraction of time series that are detected by each method as irreversible as a function of the length of these of this time series. Well, you can see that more or less all algorithms agree that the longer the time series, the better. This makes sense. But then you have some uh, tests that work actually better with short time series. So it's not that easy. There is not one algorithm that is the best in all uh, conditions. So what we have done is a series of analysis, including adding noise, adding of layers, uh, calculate the computational cost of each one of them. And if I have to synthesize the results just in a couple of slides, what I would say that we have created a metric that assess the performance of each one of these tests. And uh, it is interesting that the best performing one is the BDS test. And it's interesting because it is the oldest one. This was proposed in 1988. So all the new ones, actually this old metric outperforms more recent proposals in the, on the topic. So which is quite weird. And second, that when we use this irreversibility to try to understand uh, differences between, for instance, control subject and patients suffering from some condition that in this case is alcoholism, uh, we say that we see that the best metric is the FK, which most importantly was one of the worst that we have detected before. And why is that? Because when we want to find differences between two groups of subject or of people, it's not the same as having the maximum sensitivity about, about on the irreversibility of the time series. So the important point here is that we have a set of metrics. Each one of them is different from the other. They have different hypotheses. And it's not as easy as to say, this is the best metric. Depending on the problem that you are tackling, you have to check which one is actually best for your problem. And just to conclude, I want to mention that uh, we also publish along with this review, an open source library in which you have the Python implementation of all the 11 irreversibility tests that we analyze in the paper. You can download it, you can play with it, and hopefully not, but if you find any error, please uh, write us back and we will try to see what's happening. <laughs> okay, and that's all, thank you all. 
Thank you, Massive, for, uh, for the talk and the perfect timing. Next uh, speaker is Ernesto Estrada, so you can share your screen. It's about path Laplacians and, Laplacian, and fractional Laplacians. Ernesto, uh, I think, um, is your microphone on? Um, Ernesto. Now, sure. now it's okay. Okay. No, yes, it's okay, no problem. So I'm not very skillful with this matter. So, okay, so thank you very much. I will talk about this uh, paper that I published in the New Journal of Physics. And um, let's say that the inspiration for this is, uh, is coming from out of equilibrium uh, uh, systems. And uh, so as uh, Ilya Prigonin says in, in, in this uh, quotation, uh, he used to say that uh, matter in proximity to equilibrium is blind because um, the, the atoms can only see or the molecules can only see what they have uh, around them. But uh, in the situation of far from equilibrium, long range correlations are produced and long range hops are produced that uh, produce or, or construct uh, uh, coherent states and, and, and what they call today physics and chemistry, I could add biology, economics, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, well, one of the consequences of these uh, long range hops is uh, super diffusive uh, behavior. So this is, this is just one experimental uh, uh, results by Sagi et al. in uh, 2012, in which they, they move some uh, rubidium atoms in an in optical lattice. And what they observe is that uh, there are uh, super diffusive behavior, which is uh, mainly characterized by the mean square displacement scaling non-linearly with time with an exponent alpha, which is bigger than one. Also the characteristic of the uh, distribution in this case is a stable distribution, it's not uh, a Gaussian one. And the full width of the, uh, full width of the half maximum scale also non-linearly with uh, time. And uh, this differs very well from the normal diffusion where the uh, scaling uh, of the mean square displacement with time is linear, and also the full width of half maximum is with the square root of time. So typically uh, how you account for, for this in the continuous space is by taking the fractional Laplacian. So the fractional Laplacian is uh, defined or well-defined mathematically by uh, this integral here, which is in the uh, real uh, d-dimensional space, and is taken here this norm in the uh, denominator of this uh, difference in the integral. And this coefficient here mainly depends only on the uh, gamma Euler gamma function. So in 2012, I introduced uh, the, the similar concept for the case of networks on, and graphs. And I call this the deep path Laplacian operator. It's an operator in a Hilbert space that act on the set of complex uh, numbers acting on the set of vertices. And it's, uh, it's a difference operator that take the difference between a function applied to uh, nodes, but not to nearest neighbors like in the standard Laplacian, but to uh, nodes which are separated at exactly a, a shortest path distance equal to D. So basically, if we extend the, the degree concept from the number of nearest neighbors that a node has to the D path degree, in this case is the number of nodes which are at a distance D from a given node, we can have that the uh, uh, deep path Laplacian operator in the case of finite uh, graphs can be represented in a very similar way as the normal or standard Laplacian. So what we typically do is to make a transformation of this deep path Laplacian. In this particular case, we are interested in the main transformer one in which what we are accounting for is for uh, a particle which is hopping not to the nearest neighbors, but to any other node with a scaling that decays as a power law of the separation between the corresponding nodes. So uh, this is the analogous of the definition of what is expected to have in the discrete uh, uh, setting for one particular uh, Laplacian operator in which you have the difference of the function applied to the corresponding uh, uh, discrete objects divided by a function of the distance between these two 
uh, 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 particular regions of the discrete space. This is defined by uh, Gilbo and Osher uh, recently in this paper. So we have proof analytically in these two papers that our uh, incorporation of the main transformed deep path Laplacian into a generalized diffusion equation produce analytically uh, super diffusive uh, behavior in one dimension, in two dimension, and in n dimension. In this particular case, we are able to reproduce sagittal experiments when uh, we have the parameter S uh, strictly bounded between one and three, and then we recover that the solution of the uh, heat equation or the diffusion equation is in this particular case, a stable distribution. Well, as you know, there are not two without three. So in the same year, Riascos and, and Mateos published in Physical Review E, uh, another approach to uh, the notion of fractional power in, uh, in, in graphs. And what they do, uh, what they did is simply taking the roots of the Laplacian, uh, the standard Laplacian metric. So this metric is a positive semi-definite. So all the, the, the roots exist and are uh, unique. So you, if you have the, the spectral decomposition, what you do is simply taking the uh, product of the uh, metric of uh, eigenvectors by the diagonal metric of eigenvalues in which you take a power uh, alpha for all of them. So the goal of uh, this paper was to compare- Ernesto, you, should, you should finish, Ernesto. Hmm? Huh? You should finish, Ernesto. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, sorry. That's all. Okay, <laughs> thank you. And sorry for, for stopping you. Okay, so thank you. And the next, uh, next speaker is uh, Ingo Fischer. So you can share. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Okay. Can you also see my slides? No. Now, now is there. Okay. Do you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Thanks everyone for well, joining we see, today. We see a paper. I don't know if this is what oh, are then, then that's the wrong uh, share because it was switching. Let me see. How do I uh, finish the, the sharing? <coughs> At the top side, Ingo. Oh. Ah, stop share. Okay. Now it's there. Okay. Let me try to. Now correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry for that. Uh, thanks for everyone being there. Um, so what is the connection between machine learning and dynamical systems? That's an important question that we have been addressing in recent years. And here I would like to concentrate on a more particular question. What do deep neural networks have to do with delay dynamical systems? And as I will show, more than you might think. Um, so this is a collaboration between Florian uh, Stelzer and Sergei Janschuk from TU Berlin, Raul Vicente from the University of Tartu, and Andre Röhm and myself here from IFISC. And it was published uh, in Nature Communications in the summer with the title Deep Neural Networks Using a Single Neuron Folded in Time Architecture Using Feedback Modulated Delay Loops. So let's have a look at a um, typical feed forward deep neural network. Um, and you see deep neural network, uh, or they call called deep, as soon they have more than one hidden layer. And you see here, for example, just a second, okay. Um, three hidden layers, and usually they're uh, feed forward connected. Um, and the question is how can we uh, transfer them or uh, re consider them or relate them uh, to a dynamical system? And the answer is a very easy one, a very generic one. Consider you had a, a needle and a thread and your, your nodes or neurons would be beads with a hole and you would pick them up following the, the black arrows. And when you arrive at the bottom, of one of the hidden layers, you go to the top of the next one and you continue again from top to bottom. 
and you see what happens, then you can straighten uh, your line out, uh, your thread out, and that becomes the, the timeline uh, of a dynamical system. You see that the nodes become, um, let's say, uh, states of a dynamical system, uh, which are uh, separated by equidistant intervals theta. And you see that the feedforward connections here from uh, one layer to the next layer simply become uh, delayed connections. So here you get simply the delayed feedback uh, through that. And if you take this system now with its delayed feedback connections, um, you can translate it into a dynamical system like this one. Uh, you have a nonlinear function, which you, uh, was before the activation function. So it's now a nonlinearity, and you have all the delayed feedback loops which correspond to the connections that you had before between the uh, and layers. And uh, so you, you can really def uh, or formulate a scalar delay differential equation like this one. And A of T, the input uh, being here, uh, the information that you feed in, a bias, uh, and then the different delayed feedback loops. And if you take really all uh, feedback connections or delayed feedback loops, then you have a full equivalence with a standard deep neural network. Certainly, you will try to get rather to uh, more sparsely connected networks because they require less uh, training data and also less uh, calculations. And while uh, certainly you have uh, in the feedforward networks no intralayer connections, if you now in the dynamical system reduce the separation between the nodes, you get also intralayer coupling. And the question is, what does that have an influence for the training? So different delay loops certainly define in a connectivity matrix uh, diagonals for one delay. And if you want to have different weights, you need to be able to modulate them. So we have, we need modulators in the different delay loops. Uh, but the training actually is quite straightforward. Uh, if you have a large theta, you can use the same gradient descent by a backpropagation training like you have from the deep neural networks. But you can even go to the, to the limit now of very small theta and train them. And then you have to take into account the intralayer connections. Um, and that would be interesting because you can go then to much higher, op uh, faster operation if you're implemented in hardware. The scaling is interesting because uh, the hidden layer size can easily be scaled by increasing the delay. Um, increasing the number of hidden layers doesn't require any topolo topolo topological change. <coughs> the maximum number of delays you would require is 2n minus 1, so it's linear in n. The tests that we did are for standard benchmark tests, uh, image recognition tests. You see here MNIST, Fashion MNIST, the house number test, SVHN, and CIFAR 10 is an image recognition test. And the performance that we got uh, was reasonably well, uh, not comparable to the best uh, systems that you have nowadays, but reasonably well for the very uh, simple configuration that we chose. And uh, the red and the blue line differ in the sense that for the red line, we neglected the local couplings. So we neglected small thetas. And for the blue curves, we uh, took them into consideration. And you see that if in the training, we uh, take the smaller separations into consideration, we can go to much smaller, so one to two order of magnitude, smaller distances, separations between the nodes uh, in the dynamical system and still get the more or less the same performance. Um, the cosine similarity is just comparing the uh, gradient uh, uh, that we can approximate from uh, numerically to the ones that we get from back propagation. You should so you finish, see, Ingo. Yeah, you yeah finish. I'm concluding. I'm concluding. Mm -hmm. uh, so exploring the connection between delayed dynamical systems and deep neural networks, we see that this allows for a truly uh, multidisciplinary approach to information processing. And we hope um, that it will lead to a more fundamental understanding of information processing and more sophisticated artificial neural networks and going towards even the continuous time limit is underway. Thank you very much and Felix uh, Fiestas. Thank you, Ingo. Good, so next uh, talk is by Roberta Sambrini about dynamical phase transitions in quantum reservoir computing. So Roberta. Yes, just a second. Okay, can you see my presentation and hear me? Yes. Okay, so 
let's see if I'm able to keep in time. <laughs> so the presentation of today is about dynamical phase transition in quantum reserve computing. So this is our second uh, year. Uh, so I don't know, it has to stop, okay. but okay, Co continue, please, sorry. So let's try to give a two, two words of context. What is, what is reserve computing? This is a method in which a system is used to process and input information. It's particularly suitable for, uh, suited for uh, uh, temporal series analysis. And the important part is that it is uh, actually, it is actually, uh, the training is actually reduced to the, um, limited to the output layer. So this makes this uh, kind of approach in machine learning particularly um, easy and also can be less energy consuming. So it is, uh, these are important advantages. The reserve can be implemented either with recurrent neural networks, but also with generic uh, physical systems. And uh, here you have uh, a series of examples given. And more recently, this has been extended also to the case in which the reserve is a quantum system, even rise to quantum reserve computing. So here, um, what we want to answer are questions like, what condition must a physical system fulfill to be a good quantum reserve computing? And in particular, we will address the relation between the dynamical regime of a quantum uh, system and uh, its performance. So this uh, uh, was a slide of the presentation of the last year, and actually this was one of the questions that we raised in the outlook, so in the following months we have been um, completing the work and publishing it and the main results about this analysis is that if you consider a system like an easing um, model as i write here in which we have some disorder either in the couplings but also in the local uh, magnetic fields what we have is that this is a system in which the dynamic is very rich very interesting and complex and in some situation you can have that if the system is very large um, you actually observe local thermalization. So the local observable are actually consistent with the thermal state. And this is what is known as the eigenmo thermalization hypothesis in the quantum system. And it is very important because it is at the basis of statistical uh, approach. On the other hand, it is being reported in the last two, three decades that actually it is also possible to have deviation from these behaviors. And in this situation, what you have is that increasing the degree of disorder in a system you, have to add, you can actually observe many body localization in which instead of reaching a state that is like a thermal state, you have uh, um, the growth of an extensive number of local uh, integral of motion. So if you now play with our parameters in this model, so the age and the degree of disorder D, we actually see that there, is, uh, uh, there are different regimes uh, of thermal phase and localized phase. So one of the main points of our work has been to connect the presence of these phases in the isolated system to the operation of the non-autonomous, so the auto equilibrium system that you use for quantum reserve computing, and to see that actually in presence of the map that governs the quantum reserve computing using this reserver, there are some property uh, that are actually better in the thermal phase, while in the localized phase, the system perform poorly. So I do not have time to speak about the property, but just uh, in the paper, you can find the explanation of this kind of property and other figure of merits that we've been considering. Like for instance, here, the information processing capacity that is lower in this uh, uh, many body localized phase being larger in these other thermal phases. So we conclude that these are, these thermal phases are the mm, most uh, naturally adapted to reserve computing. While in uh, the many body phase, you have worse performance, giving also uh, an important message about the role of disorder. So in some cases, increasing the disorder can be detrimental for reserve computing. And we, I'm not showing, but we have also found an improved performance at the edge of the transition, similar to classical case. So now what we are interested, of course, is to apply the analysis to uh, temporal series analysis. So this is going to be a possible collaboration topics with other people. So these are my five minutes. I just want to thank you for your attention, refer to this paper for more details. And I'd like also another couple of things of this year that are the, this book of digital and complex information uh, that if you are interested, we should be receiving mm -hmm. some copies in these days. And the other that we are uh, progressing to uh, in this question. Ah, so the the and, uh, the I will send the link. Sorry. Ah,
just finished. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the talk and for the timing. And then let's now move to Durens, Durens Serra, about Fabriper interferometry in topological insulators. I um, yes, let me let, let me I will uh, mute everybody just because I see that I will try to mute everybody and then uh, you can now um, uh, Durens unmute yourself. Durens, you can unmute yourself now. Yes. Okay. Can okay. you hear me? Yes. Yes. And you see my screen? Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. Yes. So um, these are my co-authors. Uh, this is a collaboration done with Belgium and German, Germany and Spain. And this is the paper I, I am presenting. Um, uh, a study of topological insulator material of device of um, nanowires made of topological insulator materials. And these uh, topological insulators have the property of being insulating, electrically insulating in the bulk. For instance, if we take a sample with the shape of a nanowire, it's ins insulating in the bulk and conducting on the surface. Metallic, uh, metallic surface states appear here on the surface. Uh, this, uh, this system has uh, a remarkable property, which is spin momentum locking, which is uh, one spin is propagating in one direction and uh, the other spin in the reverse direction. This is uh, when uh, all the rest of quantum numbers are the same. For instance, in this geometry for a given angular momentum, a spin up is in one direction and a spin down is in the other direction. This provides topological protection for the transmission or the transport uh, of signals along these channels. Uh, the surface states in these topological insulator materials have a relativistic, um, uh, they are similar to relativistic fermions, to Dirac fermion, to massless Dirac fermions. They show a linear dispersion of the energy uh, with respect to the momentum with a crossing at a low energies, ideally a crossing point, which is called a Dirac point. And they have, they also present uh, electron hole symmetry. So uh, states that uh, above the Dirac point and below the Dirac point, they are of electron-like and hole-like character. The interest uh, in this system, in these systems is that, or in these materials is that they can uh, lead to robust uh, devices where transmission is not affected by impurities. For instance, here in a 2D sample, like in the spin hole effect, when we have spin up is propagating in one direction, even though there may be some impurities on the, on the sample, there is no uh, back scattering because uh, uh, the, the, the back propagating state is with the other spin. So as long as the spin is not reversed, there is no back scattering. What we have studied, is a three-dimensional topological insulator nanowire with a gated central section that acts like a, a cavity, like a fabri perot interferometer cavity. And this is um, obtained by means of gates. Um, by applying uh, several gates, it is possible in principle to control the length of this cavity. And we also consider the presence of a magnetic field. Our results in, in zero fields, in zero magnetic field, we obtain different regimes with fabri perot type of oscillations, um, depending on the length of this cavity. And in finite field, we find beating patterns with the length of the cavity, periodic Ajarano bomb oscillations in large field, and also the realization of the perfect tunneling, uh, the perfect tunneling um, uh, in the case of a single mode. And we have also studied transverse asymmetry effects uh, in, in the cavity. Uh, this is an example um, of the fabri perot oscillations in zero field regimes. We have taken a situation in which the energy bands in the leads are given by these blue lines. The energy bands in the central, central part are given by, by these uh, dashed lines, and they are fixed. And then we sweep the energy. 
uh, this plot, this blue line is showing a sweep of the energy um, in this uh, configuration of the system. We have a region here A in green when both bands in the center and the leads, they have the same curvature, then we have oscillations. A region B when there is a gap uh, due to the finite size effect, there is a gap in the, in the center and this gives a re reduced transmission. Then a region with bands of opposite curvature in leads and center. And then we have uh, uh, very large oscillations uh, in the transmission, a region D with a gap again, similar to the region B. And then another region here with gaps uh, with energy bands of the same curvature, which is similar to the, the region A. In the lower part, I showed the dependence with the length. And here, um, uh, with the length of the cavity for uh, the region with bands of opposite curvature, we find big uh, oscillations, fabry perot type oscillations. In presence of a gap, we have a, 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 a exponentially suppressed transmission. And then also for region with bands with the same curvature, we find fabry perot type oscillations. In non-zero field, in non-zero magnetic field, we find uh, beating patterns in the in the transmission as a function of the length, and these are due to the to the splitting of the bands, which is induced by the finite magnetic field. And in large fields, uh, we find a Harano bomb oscillations, where the transmission is pinned at a value one when there is a single mode uh, in the central lead in central cavity and um, a non-quantized value of the transmission when we have several modes uh, that can be uh, back reflected. You we, have you should studied, finish. You should. Uh, yeah, we have also studied asymmetry effects, but I think I will skip those. So I, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jurens. So Sorry. next uh, next talk is by Cristobal Lopez. So you should unshare, Jurens, you should unshare the- Stop okay. share, yes. And then next one is Cristóbal López about Lagrangian betweenness. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, well, I'm going to present a moment. A work uh, 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 done in a, is, is an international collaboration. Uh, from the is uh, myself and Emilio are in, in this collaboration, and the main author is Enrico Sergiacomi. Who is supposed to now at MIT in the US. This is a, a people also from Germany, France, and also people in the US. The paper is, was published in last summer in Nature Communication, and it's about um, three main ideas. The idea of betweenness, uh, we try to put uh, these three ways together betweenness in a complex network, how to link this, uh, the idea of betweenness species in terms of dynamical systems in terms of Lyapunov exponent, and then how this idea this, the, uh, of uh, betweenness that can and can show uh, bottlenecks in dynamical system can be useful to identify hotspots or regions of uh, high biodiversity in the ocean. So let me stress again this, this idea, whose framework is um, uh, what we, some years ago, and also with Enrico, we, we, we introduced the idea of Lagrangian for our network essentially is, a, is to express a fluid motion in terms of uh, expressing it as, a, as a, a complex network. And the idea is to divide, for instance, we have a, the Mediterranean Sea, we divide it in different regions, and every region is a node, and then we let the particles flow with the, uh, we let the particles go with the flow, and then in this way we can um, have connections between and, and uh, establish a, a network of connections. Um, uh, from this uh, flow dynamics. This is what we call Lagrangian flow network. And in terms of these uh, flow networks, the, what we have uh, tried to spread in the last year is uh, how to spread these network quantities and to make a dictionary to spread this in terms of um, uh, dynamic assistance uh, expressions. Uh, one of them, one of these network quantities, the between, the between is that it's the one we have explored in this paper. Essentially, in, in, in complex network, the betweenness tells you about nodes where many paths go, go through and for instance can spread in, in bottles in a network. If we have a, a dynamical system, uh, this could be related to many trajectories going to uh, the same place. Then we have here 
uh, a narrow channel then dispersing after that to also many different many different places this can be a flow potent so in this paper we have expressed this uh, betweenness in the laranja flow networks in, ter in terms of Lyapunov exponent which are dynamical quantities and uh, coming from dynamical system and also we have applied it to an oceanographic setting which is our final interest these are for example what we obtain for instance we apply this measurement to to the mediterranean sea we see areas where mm, um, a lot of uh, path of fluid go through this is in the mediterranean sea this is in the Adriatic, where we can observe the two giants uh, that appear typically there in the region or in the Kerguelen area, where these, uh, these ch ch channels uh, also express that many, many different trajectories co arrive to them and then disperse uh, after them. And final, uh, the, the idea is well, are these bottlenecks in the ocean relevant for? Well, the idea is that they are relevant. Uh, uh, to promote biodiversity, and we did uh, essentially some comparison of uh, betweenness measurements in the Grosio, in the Grosio current with some data we had of planktonic species, and I will not get into the details. And then essentially what we saw is that uh, there is a positive correlation between this betweenness measurement and the biodiversity of the species. So uh, in principle, and then we have, we have to go through more studies, uh, these uh, bottlenecks in the fluid, these uh, areas of high betweenness uh, really promote biodiversity. So that's all I wanted to, to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Cristobal. Very nice. um, okay, so next, next talk is, uh, was uh, announced to be by Victor uh, Martinez Aguiluz, but he finally couldn't come. But uh, but Juan Fernandez Gracia, who is a collaborator, will will present the the work. That is it's about the global network of ports for, for fishing. Okay, Juan, you are muted, Juan. Juan, you should okay. Okay. okay now. Now I am. Uh, sorry for that. So yeah, I will talk. I will continue talking about the ocean, as, uh, as uh, was Cristobal uh, doing about the. But now about some some um, human activities in the ocean. So we have this work recently published, the global network of ports supporting high seas fishing, together with uh, Jorge Rodriguez, who is at Timedea, Carlos Duarte, Xavier Goyen, and Victor Aguiluz. Uh, so the data we had was uh, some trajectories. Well, trajectories for for one year long of 112,000 uh, different vessels, fishing vessels. Here you can see a movie of what happened uh, around the Balearic Islands uh, for, for January. This is for 2014. So we wanted to tackle some, some interesting problem that, that could be due to, due to fishing uh, in, the, in the global ocean. So there are, there are many. Uh, the most obvious one is sustainable exploitation, but uh, you can find others like uh, trawlers, Move, uh, move the sediments that are in the venting part in the, in the bottom of, of the sea. So the carbon that is sequestrated there goes up. And so this is uh, a, a problem with the service of carbon sequestration that the ocean provides. Uh, there are others like bycatch. So you can see that here some overlap between uh, sharks uh, trajectories and, and fishing vessels trajectories. So that's, that's another problem. So where are these problems um, more, more important? So there, there is something that is called, so the ocean is divided into many, many different parts uh, or regions that depend on how, how you, you define them. But here we are only interested in what is a, a exclusive economic zone that is where uh, a nation can put some, some regulation so it can handle their fish stocks. And, um, and make them thrive or not. And then beyond uh, those areas that are 200 nautical miles from, from your shore, there is uh, what we call, well, what are called the high seas. And these have weaker regulation and it's a common resource. So it's uh, prone to the, to the tragedy of the commons. 
So I'm going to try to present three, three results in, in this uh, setting. So this is the first one. The first one we looked at, uh, so from these trajectories, we extracted uh, the, the fishing effort. So the time that the, the vessels are spent on, on fishing, and then we assign to different parts of the ocean how much time has uh, have been there uh, vessels fishing. This is not uh, distributed homogeneously uh, among the ocean, but uh, we see uh, that the, there is um, a clear uh, uh, pattern that uh, many EECs, these economic exclusive economic zones, at the border but outside, so in the in the high seas uh, region, you see accumulation of uh, of um, fishing effort. So. Uh, so you see as a function of the distance from shore in the 200 kilometers that are first from the end of the economic exclusive zone you have much more fishing uh, effort so this points to some kind of free riding of the so inside your economic exclusive zone you put some policies to recover your your fish but then people go to the to the border of it and and catch them so for example this uh, this uh, inset of uh, in this b in the peruvian coast you can see here a, a, a movie for January 2014. You have the, the fleet in the national fleet inside their national waters doing whatever, but then you have this international fleet that accumulates in the border of the of the EC, which is uh, quite productive. So that's the first result. Second uh, result I wanted to comment is uh, given that we had a lot of uh, of trajectories in the global ocean. Uh, we we took that uh, we created a, a network of uh, different places that are are visited by these trajectories in the in the order that they are visited, and using uh, a community detection algorithm, InfoMap, we found fourteen different uh, what we call marine provinces. So these provinces are are um, are. Um, are in line with the trajectories of, of vessels. So you, we propose this as, uh, as um, administrative regions that make more sense maybe that, than the ones that uh, we are using right now, that are the ones given here uh, at the bottom of the slide by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Okay, let's go now for the third uh, part of the of the work so then we created so now we know people are fishing in this in these uh, marine regions who is fishing there so uh, we constructed a network that of ports and fishing uh, uh, fishing marine provinces to see which ports were supporting that uh, that uh, fishing effort that was being made in this uh, in these uh, marine provinces if we take just the, the top 10 ports that support the the highest um, fishing effort. What we see is basically that uh, the the ports are high, highly uh, specialized in in one province, one marine province, mostly, except for uh, in the Pacific uh, Ocean, in the Central Pacific, and in Indonesia. Uh, so this this goes again uh, uh, along the same line that we said about. Uh, using these marine provinces as administrative regions. Uh, we can do something more, and that is to... Should, to... Uh, should be finishing, Juan. Okay, then I think that that's enough, uh, these uh, results, and thank you for listening. Okay, good. Thank you. Now, next talk is by Manuel Matias about parasites in marine diseases. Can you see the well the slide? Yes. Okay, thank you. So I'll start counting time. Well, uh, thank you very much, and and, and welcome to, to everyone. This is a, a work that is a pure uh, uh, ecological uh, uh, theoretical collaboration. The the, the co-authors are Alex, that is my my PhD student, who has done most of the work. Then two. A biologist, one that is a, a parasitologist uh, working here in Mallorca, Amalia Grau, then in, in Port and Drugs, and Iris Hendrix, that may you, many of you uh, may know from Iberia, and then myself. Uh, this is a, a, 
actually uh, 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 real I mean result from the Sumaiko uh, uh, the project in which some of us work and has been published in this in this reference well the motivation is that recently so Pina Nobilis so if we're not uh, having nicer pictures Pina Nobilis is a it's a, it's a big muscle, it's kind of big, uh, sorry, it's a big morus, it's a kind of a big muscle, something like 80 centimeters or, or one meter uh, long. And then, uh, so was part, uh, a well-known part from the, the, the Posidonia Midos. Then recently, a few years ago, I mean, a, a so-called massive mortality event was detected in which more than 90 and even more than 95% uh, of, of the individuals died. And this was reported here by authors in Mallorca, by, by one of uh, our co-authors, Amalia and, and, and Gaetano Catanese, that was produced by a parasite. Then the, the massive mortality event so, uh, was, uh, was so uh, quick, so fast, that then there was an attempt of rescuing uh, individuals of Pina nobilis and keeping them in tanks. Actually, this has given to the uh, rise to the data that we have that we uh, uh, will try to, uh, to analyze. And then we are uh, uh, proposing uh, uh, an epidemic model for this. This epidemic model is different from the SIR modeling that many of you uh, may know in which the, uh, the, the hosts are immobile, don't, uh, cannot move, and the parasites are- so, Sorry, Manuel, are you, sorry, are you uh, moving slides? We see only the first slide. Is this- uh... No, I, I have moved slides. Uh, uh, well, that doesn't move, so I recommend you stop stop sharing and return back, perhaps. Ma actually, you didn't put the full screen presentation mode. Ah, well. well, I see the, the, the full screen presentation mode. In uh, uh, Can you see the slides now? No. Ah, sorry. Well, because we cannot hear you, you well. I try to. Now I see. Okay, is this the second slide or? Well, the second was the, the motivation. This is the third. Okay. Okay. But actually, this is the model. So the. the so it moves now. Okay. The Good. one that infect, and well, I want to say that this model is, is quite complicated. So uh, it has. This is a four compartment model. There's inter interestingly, as the, the SIR also, by the way, has an, an exact quantity that allows to write the, the parasite population in terms of the, of the other variables, so reduce the, the complexity of the model. And there's a second way of simplifying the, the equations because the dynamics of the hosts that are here are slower than the dynamics of the part. Well, in the case that this happens, that appears to be the, the physiological, the real biological case, then one can reduce the equations. And, and here I'm showing that in this case, that this parameter that regulates, I will explain the parameters, this mu is the mortality and lambda is the production rate of the parasites and beta is the infection rate. Gamma is a, as in the ASIR model, the, the time to die in this case, because R in our case is the remote means the, dead because there is no no uh, uh, long-term immunity in this in invertebrates then we see that as as we increase this parameter i mean this approximation that we are doing here is is, is quite good and in in this approximation what we are doing is replacing the the, the parasite population by the, the infected population then in the end interestingly interestingly we have an sir kind mo uh, like model so I, this, is, this is a model in which these species are immobile. P are the ones that are mobile. Here we have an effective SIR model in which implies that there's direct S and I uh, interaction. Sorry, I think the time is over. And then I, uh, I want to show uh, results from the, from the uh, comparison with the, with the experimental data. These are data at more or less uh, fixed uh, temperature from uh, two of the stations in which uh, the, uh, the Pina Nobilis individuals were kept in tanks. So it means that in principle, we think and, and, and we prove that uh, a, compartment, a compartmental model, so a mean field model is good to represent this data. 
Here we have a fit with the with the first model, the, the, the exact reduction here with the, with the approximate model that I presented in the in the previous slide. And then we can see that the fit is quite good, but interestingly here, so what we do, this problem has uh, three parameters. This problem has uh, uh, two parameters. So in this problem that has the three parameters, we fix one of the parameters and we observe that the, the other two, this lambda prime, is I can explain I can I'm not explain is, is the product of, of lambda and beta can so we uh, the, the minimum lives in, in, in a valley so means that there is a fixed relationship between uh, these two parameters that actually corresponds to the the SIR reduction so the data are telling us that the this reduction this fast low reduction is, is quite good and here we have the direct uh, implementation of the of the approximation in which I, I, because we have one less parameter, we can then uh, uh, optimize the value of gamma that here in this case was fixed to, to be gamma equal to one. So here for the two, here we have two data sets, one corresponding to, to, uh, to IFAPA or, or, or kind of data, the second to the oceanographic in, in Valencia. Then here we see that one of them, the, the optimal value of gamma is actually different than one. Manuel, you should use the finish. Okay, this was just a uh, presentation of, uh, of <laughs> the next step of the work, that is the, <laughs> the introduction of space. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. Now, next. Sharing. Stop sharing, yeah. Next right. speaker, Sandro Meloni. Okay. We talk about an ecological approach to okay. online communication. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And now we see now your you slide. The you are seeing the full screen right now. Mm, okay. Yes. Okay. So great. <clears throat> so okay. So since we don't have too much time, let me start. Uh, so let me start by first of all by thanking thanking my my collaborators in this work. Actually, they made most of the work. I just signed it. So probably you should that. Uh, also, the institute should thank them, but the idea is that this is, this work has been done as part of a collaboration that's been going on for a few years now. And the idea, the assumption behind this collaboration is that actually our behavior, especially so human behavior, especially in uh, online social networks like, for example, Twitter, Facebook, and so on. Actually, it's not so different from the rest of the animals, of the social behavior of other animals in natural ecosystems. And so what we can do, we can use, let's say, the tools that have been developed for the study of natural ecosystems, for the interaction between different animals, to understand, let's say, our behavior. And this work actually was is the first of a series of actually where we are trying to adapt, let's say, these um, these assumptions to study, for example, how collective attention emerges in these uh, in online social discussions. So to do that, what we did was pretty simple, was we took a bunch of data sets from many different events that focus collective event, uh, attention. So for example, political events, uh, sporting events, and the natural disasters. And then from that, what we did, we build a series of bipartite networks with that connects to actually the users and the topics that they use. So for example, in this case, hashtags. So we have a connection between users and the hashtag that they use and how these networks evolve through time. And then we analyze those networks in terms of measures that we usually find, for example, in the study of ecological networks. So for example, modularity that is a measure of how well defined are communities inside a network or nestedness that actually is a measure of uh, how the hierarchical is the network is organized, the organization of the network, and then in block nestedness that actually is somehow a mixture of the two. And so with these tools, what we did was we analyzed different events. For example, here we're talking about the Spanish general elections or the uh, an earthquake that hit Nepal a few years ago. And so actually we started out, for example, um, modularity and nestedness evolved through time in these networks. And actually what we found in Ponto results here is that what happens is that at the beginning in the, let's say the calmer periods, uh, the network is really modular, meaning that actually people is talking about specific topics and the discussion is divided about different topics. But then 
When you reach, let's say the event arrives, what happens is that uh, the modularity goes down and the net, uh, nest net explodes, meaning that actually it is just one single conversation organized in a hierarchical way. And then after that, what happens is that everything goes back to normal. And these, let's say, bouncing back and forth between these two states, we call uh, structural flexibility because the network actually change its structure uh, when an event uh, arrive. And then this is even clearer if you look, for example, at the in-block nestedness, then what happens is that we saw that actually the actual network is communities organized in a hierarchical way, and then you have just one single uh, organization, let's say. And so to understand why this happens and how to understand what are the causes behind this, what we did was uh, trying to model it. And here comes, let's say, the ecological twist, where actually what we did was to use a model, an ecological model that had been used to explain the emergence of nestedness in mutualistic networks. So how to explain an optimization model actually explain the emergence of nestedness. In this case, again, we have a bipartite networks, for example, in this case, a plant pollinator network, but actually the optimization is driven by the different species that actually they tend to uh, minimize the competition with the species of the same type, for example, between plants and plants or pollinators and pollinators, and they try to maximize the mutualistic interactions. So in terms of plant pollinators interactions, and actually this optimization alone, very simple, just a random rewiring, uh, allows to explain the emergence of nestedness. And what we did was exactly the same. So map, let's say this model in our context. So mapping, for example, users and hashtags as different species. That actually they are trying again to minimize competition and maximize, let's say their mutualistic, mutualistic interactions with just one, uh, one little more than actually the fact that we included the different topics in this in this way. So people could be interested in one different in different topics and uh, hashtag can be related to different topics. So at the end, what we did was we used this adapted model, let's say this ecological adapted model, and we started with a random configuration. So user and hashtags uh, connections are random. We let the optimization run for, for a few times. So we end up with, let's say, an optimized uh, network where actually competition is minimized and mutualism is is maximized and then after that we introduce an event so something that focuses attention throughout let's say a specific topic and what we got at the end was actually we were able to reproduce exactly the same patterns that we saw in the real data and this means that actually that you can explain the entire human behavior about this kind of stuff so let's say in this kind of conversation by simply an optimization process. So actually users are trying to optimize, let's say what is called their visibility in this sense. And, and this you is actually- You finish, Alessandro. Yeah, the, actually I was finishing and uh, I was saying that uh, this was actually the main message and I'd like to wish you an happy of state. Mm -hmm. Bye. Okay. Thank you very much. Next, uh, next talk is by Lucas Lacasa about digital contact tracing. Hi, yeah, let me share my screen. Okay, can you see the screen? Hopefully you can see the screen now. Yes. And you can hear me, yeah? Yes. All right, so thanks very much. Um, so, um, yeah, so this paper is the result of my involvement along with many other people in the design and uh, um, development of a pilot study to check the effectiveness of uh, the Spanish contact tracing app, Radar COVID. Um, so the take home message uh, of, this, uh, of this work is the contact tracing app works well uh, and, it can, and it can detect uh, plenty of close contacts and therefore help mitigate the pandemic. But for that to happen, people need to download it. And second of all, health departments of autonomous communities need to provide the codes that uh, infected people have to log in their, their app. And that unfortunately is not seeming to happen. So the paper is a collaboration with uh, many people, as I said. Um, so we have, um, 
computer scientists. Uh, so we have uh, epidemiologists. Uh, I don't know here if it's infectious disease uh, modelers, and we have uh, complex systems people uh, like Alex and myself. Um, right. So um, yeah. Let me tell you a little bit about, about the interest story of, of, of this. So this project about the contact tracing app was led by the Secretary of State of Digitalization in, in Spain. And back in 2020, they had a wish list. So they wanted to develop a, a privacy preserving app following something similar to the DP3T protocol. Um, there was back in the day a technological barrier and that was that um, the phones were not really prepared to, 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 to set up a, an app like this. And it was only uh, when, when Apple and Google developed their, their well-known exposure notification protocol that, that is embedded in the operate, operating system of the smartphones that these uh, apps could work. Um, uh, the government wanted to have an, an app for the whole country, not, not like 17 different apps. And, a, and an app that was interop interoperable with other countries. And from a scientific point of view, uh, the fact that privacy was by design was imposed brought some scientific trade-offs. So basically we were not able to, um, to, to measure almost anything, uh, which is a pity from a, from a complex uh, network point of view, but, but it was, uh, it's good from a privacy point of view. Um, from a public health point of view, what we needed is, was that the app had a short turnaround time that, it, that had to be complementary to manual contact tracing, so eff efficient and scalable uh, in, in a situation with plenty of, of infections. And uh, critically, we wanted to check whether that was a tool that could detect uh, close contact between strangers, which is something that manual contact tracing cannot detect by, by, by definition. So in order to say that the app worked, uh, we needed to, to develop a, a pilot study and, and, and yeah, and that's what I was involved in. So the time frame is a little bit like this. Um, back in May, 2020, Apple and Google released their, their protocol. Already by June, 2020, the, the COVID app, the rather COVID app, the Spanish contact tracing app was already uh, developed much before other apps in, in Europe, for instance, uh, the UK one. Uh, then in July 2020, uh, we conducted the pilot uh, to check the effectiveness in a realistic scenario that was that happened in the Canary Island. In August of that year, the system was ready to deploy to be deployed at scale, and we sent this paper uh, to publication, and the paper was published in, in January. So um, in a nutshell, uh, the experiment that we did in the Canary Island was to measure several things like recruitment, adoption, adherence, compliance, detection, adher um, and, 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 some, and some other things. Um, all of you know how, how con a contact tracing app works, right? So I'm not gonna go into the details, but I'm gonna just jump into, into, the, into the summary of what we found. So first of all, um, we, we did a very um, deep communication campaign to raise awareness within the context of the pilot study. And um, as, as, a, as, a, an out, as a byproduct, we measured that at least 33% of the population adopted the technology. Um, this is a bottleneck. So if people don't adopt the technology, then, then, then this doesn't work. It's like having a car without gasoline. Um, Interestingly, we measured that um, uh, the detection of the app was high. So the app could trace about six close contacts per index case. And that was like twice as many as, as the average number of contacts that a manual contact tracer can, can trace. And of course, it's totally scalable for free. Um, and the other inter interesting thing is that we measured that between, well, depending on the survey form, between 23 and 39 percent of those close contacts that were measured by the app in the experiment 
were contacts between strangers. So strangers to the index case. So people, for instance, that had a close contact with the, with the index case in a bar, in a restaurant, um, in the public transport, etc. Look, as you should should finish. Okay, so uh, okay, so the story is you know the 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 story the 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 the, the app didn't really took off in Spain because of lack of, lack of engagement from the from the government and autonomous communities. Uh, interestingly, and this is my last slide. For comparison, we have the UK app that was released later, and already it, this paper in Nature tells you that you can um uh, evitate uh between 100,000 and 900,000 infections in the between uh, October and December 2020. That's it. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks a lot. So next next talk is by David Sanchez. Could you unshare your screen Lucas and then uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> then David can talk about Multilingual societies. Just a moment, I mute myself and then share screen. Here we go. Can you see the presentation? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. So the title of this the short talk is Capturing the Diversity of Multilingual Societies. And it was uh, work done in collaboration with uh, Thomas Louvre, who deserves like 95% uh, of the credit for this work, and Jose Ramasco. So the question here is, um, uh, well, uh, reality is that, uh, let's say, let's put it this way, uh, the majority of countries in the world are multilingual, okay? So very few uh, countries speak just uh, one language. So I think it's very natural to ask ourselves, what are the different scenarios that we, we can um, see um, when we uh, look at the uh, different um, speech communities in, in regions and, and countries uh, worldwide? So here I put two examples. This, uh, these were plotted using a data set of uh, geolocated tweets um, in which all, let's say, posts in, in tweets, uh, the language which, is, which people uh, use is uh, automatically detected. And then um, uh, just for uh, simplicity, we uh, split the map into different cells and here, we have, let's say, two different cases, uh, Belgium and Catalonia. So for Belgium, we have two, as you know, uh, let's say two uh, uh, linguistic uh, groups, okay? So people speak uh, Dutch in the North, French in the South. And then uh, there is a group of bilinguals mainly located at the boundary in Brussels uh, between the two uh, speech communities and some of them also in the East of the, of the country. Uh, by contrast, in, in Catalonia, we also have, uh, this is also a bilingual region in which we have Spanish and Catalan. Both uh, monolingual uh, groups are somehow uh, uh, spread out in the, in the region. And this is particularly true for the, for the bilinguals, okay? So this, uh, let's say, are two, let's say, like uh, different categories uh, for, for uh, linguistic uh, scenarios, okay? Here in the left for, for, for Belgium, we have a spatial separation of uh, speech communities. And here in the right for Catalonia, uh, we can conclude that we have um, a mixing of, of, of languages. Then the question is, okay, is there a uh, model, mathematical model that can account for both uh, scenarios and at the same time, um, reproducing this as a stable solution, because of course this situation in both countries, um, this, uh, it has uh, stayed the same for, for, for many years. Okay, so we assume that this is basically uh, stationary. So this is the language, sorry, this is the model that, uh, that we propose that of course is built on previous models from Abraham, Strogatz and models um, uh, proposed here in house from people, people from the fields through, through the years. 
So uh, this is just a sketch, okay? We have uh, uh, two languages, uh, A, B, and then bilinguals, A, B, and then there are some rates to go from one box to the other one, okay? For instance, if we focus in uh, bilinguals, A, B going to A, so meaning that they lose language B, this is due to first, to the fraction of uh, speakers in A, the more speakers you have in A, uh, the more likely it is that you lose language B, and also uh, depends on a couple of parameters, the mortality rate. So it may happen that uh, uh, after one generation, this language is lost, and also the social prestige. Of course, if the social prestige of language A is higher than the one language B, then it's more likely to lose language B. Then there is also the reverse process in which uh, one uh, speaker of A, uh, uh, likes to learn language B. And then um, this is like, uh, this happens in a horizontal way inside the, inside the generation. And so uh, instead of mortality mu, we have to, uh, let's say, consider one minus mu and one minus S for the prestige times C. When C now, this is a, an, an extra parameter for the reverse process, which takes into account the learning rate, okay? If it's easier or more difficult to learn this uh, new language B. Okay, so uh, now one can apply this uh, model to just a single population, okay? Uh, and then we find two types of um, um, steady states, okay? The first one is the typical one that either one of the language is uh, dominant and, and the other one just uh, dies away. But also we find that due to the, to the bilinguals, it is possible that in a, in, a, in a population of bilinguals in which one of the languages uh, is, is dead, uh, there is still a mixing between, uh, between uh, um, these uh, bilinguals. And this is because of this new parameter that we um, propose here, cultural attachment. This is, let's say, the, our contribution to this, uh, to this new, to the models of uh, language competitions. This cultural attachment means that even if, a, if you have a pure bilingual, then people, uh, let's say, like to speak more one language that, than another one due to different reasons that we can call here uh, cultural attachment. Uh, then we go to the multiple. David, you should be finishing. Yes, uh, I'm finishing. Now you go to the, to the meta population, and then we can find these uh, different scenarios that we found in, in reality, namely, uh, like for instance, in Belgium. We have two speech communities separated with a boundary that mainly consists of bilingual, bilinguals or a situation where you have mixing, which is very similar to what we see now in Catalonia. And this is the um, uh, bibliographic uh, reference and thank you for your attention. Thank you, David. Okay, now let's go to the last, to the last talk. It's by Tobias Gala. Also about the temperature for linguistic features. Wow, what's that? Like, can you can you see this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, hang on. Uh, do I have to go to full slide? Uh, I don't know. Full uh, view, full screen. So can you see this? Yeah. Okay. And can you hear me? <clears throat> well, this is just a joke, right? Because two years ago, uh, you you were here at the equivalent of this event because you wanted the food uh, afterwards, right? Uh, this year, this is not possible. So you're here for the science only. Um. And now, okay, so I'm gonna present this work. Uh, this is also on language evolution and it's with these uh, people here. So Henry uh, deserves most of the credit and, and Ricardo, I would say, who guided this um, and Henry who did it. Um, so this is about um, features of languages. So languages have features. So for example, in Spanish, you put the adjective, you tend to put the adjective behind the, after the noun, right? In German and English, you put it before. And there's various other features that you can assign to languages and sort of we treat it as a binary thing, right? For example, is the word for hand and finger the same? And there are many things here that I don't really know what inflectional morphology is, but for us, it's just a binary variable, okay? So we don't need to know what these things are. Um, but linguists are interested in how stable these features are. And they change through, through time due to various processes. So one they call vertical, so from parent to child, and this is passed on the language, but it can fail. So that's like a point mutation in biology. And then there's also what they call horizontal contact. So neighboring languages are in contact and then one may influence the other. And then these processes together influence whether features go away or are established. 
And now you want to understand how uh, stable a particular feature is. And the traditional approach is to look at these um, phylogenetic trees of languages and then to establish when what feature was present and so on. But you need historical information to do this. Um, so that's very difficult and, uh, to do. And here we come up with a different method of doing this. So namely what one observes is if one pictures languages on the surface of the earth, and then now we're looking at the features in a certain catalog called 37A, the definite marker, and the, the languages are colored here according to whether they have or don't have this feature. And here there's another feature, the object verb um, um, word order. And you can see that this is maybe more scattered than this, right? If you hear there are large domains of one color and that doesn't exist so much here. So now can this structure in space tell us something about stability of these features in time? And now we made a model of this and I don't have time to explain it, of course, but it is a variant of the voter model. So there are, um, um, each language is a, is a point on a lattice and it has or doesn't have the feature and then it can spontaneously lose or acquire a feature and it copies, it can copy things from the neighbors and errors can be made in that copying process. And we set up this model um, this was not my idea, this, this was the linguist's idea, I just helped to refine the model. And then you say, what can one learn from summary statistics? So that means things like how blue or yellow is that map? And how scattered is it? When you ask a physicist how scattered is this, they think in terms of density of active interfaces. How many borders are there between yellow and blue? And it turns out for this model, one can calculate this. So that was my modest uh, contribution. So one can relate these things analytically because it's a variant of the voter model well, on a lattice, okay? We did simulations on various other geometries. You can relate the density of active interfaces to the frequency with which a feature occurs. So how blue is this map? And then one finds these uh, things are on these parabolas and these different features have parabolas of different height, heights. And these heights are parametrized by a parameter tau, which is a combination of certain model parameters, which has to do with how frequently features are copied correctly or incorrectly. More precisely, this tau is sort of something like an error rate, an effective error rate. How many errors are made per correct transmission in this process? And that parameterizes these parabolas. So you can assign to each feature, what you do is you, you look at a map from a feature and it lies on one of these parabolas. You measure how blue it is, you measure the interface density, you place it on a parabola, you can read off a temperature. Uh, that's what we did. And now I should say, this is a non-equilibrium model. So a Boltzmann would now be very angry with us, right? We're calling this temperature, but we call it temperature anyway. And then you can assign to all these features temperatures. Um, so this one is very hot, right? So it changes quickly. And this one is very cold. It doesn't change very often. Um, and we did this, and then we correlated this with existing measures of stability. And it correlates very well, except for a few outliers, which one can explain and which my linguist friends assure me are false positives or false negatives of the existing methods, they believe. Um, so, and that's it. That's what I wanted to say. Okay, good. So thank you, Tobias, and thank you everyone for this, for this session. And okay, I think we have had some exposure to, to what other people in the Institute is doing. And I hope you have enjoyed it as I enjoyed and I've learned some, something and I, and also this will this can promote uh, that to, to ask questions to the to the different people about, about the, the the subject you didn't know he or she is working on. Okay, so this is the the, the end of this talk, and then I take the opportunity to to say you that uh, to hope a nice uh, new year. I hope it's better than this one, and that next time we can we can meet in, in person with more social interaction. But uh, even if this is the case or this is not the case, uh, I'm sure that everybody will be working hard and doing good, good science and enjoying good science. And this is the, something that really uh, we like. Okay, so thank you everyone and, and see you around or next year. Okay, goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.